I'm Jeff Pogaliskis, Technical Editor for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, and I'll be your host and moderator for this section of our mRNA Day event. Over the next 75 minutes or so, you're going to hear about some really interesting work being done with mRNA and its application for infectious diseases from a really diverse group of investigators. And then after the presentations, we're going to have all the speakers on hand for our joint Q&A panel discussion, where we hope to hear from you. So if you have any questions for one of our panelists, just use the Q&A section in the stage tab to submit your questions. Now, we have three great presentations lined up for you today, where a little later on, you'll hear from Evelina Angoff, who's at Walter Reed Army Institute for Research, and is going to give us some insights into the use of mRNA LMP technology for malaria. And we'll also hear from Professor Kiat Rugsrantham from Chula Langkorn University, who's going to tell us more about the successes of bringing SARS-CoV-2 vaccine into the clinic in Thailand. But first, leading off our presentation in this track will be Dr. Andy Keel, who is a co-founder and chief development officer at Replicate Bioscience. Andy is a veteran of the life science industry with over 20 years of experience in development of drug delivery systems and an early pioneer in the fields of mRNA vaccine and nucleic acid delivery. Today, Andy is gonna address the topic of vaccines on demand and how it has developed over the past several years. Now, don't forget, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, don't hesitate to type them into the Q&A section of the stage tab on the right-hand side of your screen. Okay, without any further ado, I'll turn things over to Andy. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity uh, to present today. I'm going to present to you a talk entitled Vaccines on Demand. This is the title of a review article the Novartis mRNA vaccine team published in 2015 in Ex Expert Opinion on Drug Discovery. I'm going to walk you through some of the pivotal data that led to the conclusions in this paper. But first, on the next slide, I'm going to distinguish between conventional mRNA and self-amplifying or self-replicating uh, mRNA. At Novartis, we chose to focus our efforts on the self-amplifying systems because of the benefits uh, the platform gave. For those of you who are interested, I took this figure from a recent review article I wrote at the beginning of the year, and it's cited at the bottom of the slide. At the top, is depicted the structure of a conventional mRNA. It has a five prime cap structure, uh, a five prime and three prime untranslated region, and in the center for vaccine applications, you encode the antigen. And then at the five prime end, it has a poly A tail. The self-amplifying RNA system contains the same elements, but it also encodes the non-structural proteins from an alpha virus. And when expressed, these self-assemble to form the viral replicase that allows self-amplification of this vector. One copy in a cell becoming 10,000 copies. And functionally, this enables greater levels of antigen expression and greater duration of expression. So what was the expert opinion that we published in 2015. We predicted that mRNA vaccines might be used as a rapid response platform for future pand pandemics. Here I'm showing you figure two uh, from the paper, which models mRNA production capacity, human doses per liter of uh, bioreactor as a function of human dose along the x-axis. Obviously, at the time, we had no data in humans, and we'd um, you know, tested model mRNA vaccine systems in non-human primates and other large animal species. However, this clearly demonstrates the advantage of driving the dose below 10 micrograms in terms of uh, production capacity. And we were excited by the opportunity of getting a dose as low as one microgram, which might drive you know, 5 million hu human doses per liter. And these were you know, uh, production capacities that really could never be achieved uh, in conventional uh, fermentation uh, technologies. As a team, we were 
very optimistic that we could achieve lower doses through improvements in the vector design and also around delivery. The RNA vaccine program began in Novartis in 2008. Our vision was to reinvent the gene vaccine and move beyond what had been achieved with DNA and viral vectors. Develop a synthetic approach without the complications of cell culture and use a non-viral delivery system that avoided anti-vector immunity issues seen with viral delivery systems. It needed to be safe, scalable, and widely applicable uh, to many disease targets, a platform technology. Historically, we'd been working with viral replicon particles. This is the same type of RNA, self-amplifying RNA, that's packaged in a packaging cell line into a viral particle. The alpha virus structural proteins, the E1 and E2 glycoproteins, are embedded in the lipid envelope of the cell and the capsid protein encapsulates the RNA, the particle buds off, you then harvest it and you use it as uh, the delivery system for the vaccine. While it had been shown this technology worked well in humans, it was incredibly difficult uh, to scale and purify the viral replicon particles. So our vision was to move over to a synthetic delivery system with the same RNA and hope we could achieve the same kind of uh, uh, functional delivery, uh, but without the complications uh, that cell culture and viral delivery brought. So what are the key components of an RNA vaccine? As described in the 2021 review, there are four pillars, the antigen, vector, delivery system, and manufacturing. All four components need to be optimized and work to have a functional vaccine. We'll cover all these aspects at some point uh, during the talk, but just want to highlight that failure in one will be uh, very detrimental for the vaccine. For instance, if you pick the wrong antigen, the vaccine may work, but the functional and immune response that you produce isn't going to result in uh, optimal uh, efficacy. The first publication uh, that we wrote was in uh, 2012 in PNAS, where we showed for the first time that a lipid nanoparticle could be used as a functional delivery system for an RNA vaccine. Why did we choose LMPs? Well, they've been developed for systemic delivery of siRNA uh, out of the lab of Peter Cullis at University of British Columbia and commercialized by a spin-out company of his called Tecmura. And they'd shown using an ethanol dilution process that they could really manufacture uh, lipid nanoparticles efficiently encapsulating siRNA and then process it downstream uh, at scale to produce a, a drug product that could be administered in humans. And for the first time, we felt that there was a scalable lipid delivery system available. And so we chose to explore it. And here's the first data. Uh, we were using a self-amplifying RNA. We were working in a disease target, RSV, uh, an unmet need uh, in infants. And we knew the key antigen was the F glycoprotein. If we could raise a functional antibody response to F, we might be able to uh, prevent viral infection through the lung. So we dosed mice three weeks apart. We did a full dose response, either naked RNA from one microgram to 0 0.0, one microgram or LMP formulated material from 10 micrograms again down to 0 0.01. And we benchmarked against the same RNA in a viral replicon particle. So we have naked delivery, lipid nanoparticle delivery and viral delivery. We measured antibody responses by uh, ELISA, shown here on the left-hand side, is the immune response measured two weeks after the first vaccination. And what you can see, even with the naked self-amplifying RNA, we're getting a few responders, but most of the mice don't respond. Lipid nanoparticle delivery, we get a very flat, shallow dose response curve. And even at doses as low as 10 nanograms, we zero converted all the mice. And we were at the levels of viral delivery. 10 to the six infectious units is the upper dose uh, for a mouse 
for viral delivery for this system. On the right hand side, you can see what happens after the boost. We functionally boost all the mice and we see you know, high titers of antibodies measured by ELISA. And again, we're at the level we saw with viral replicon particles. This was actually the second experiment we did with the technology. And it was in about, you know, in 2009, we filed our patents and we moved forward uh, with lipid nanoparticle uh, delivery, but we had huge reservations about the scalability of the technology. Looking at the structure of the LMP, there are four components. There's an ionizable cationic lipid that is charged at low pH and capable of binding to the phosphate backbone of RNA, inducing nucleation. And then you have neutral lipid and cholesterol that space fill uh, the envelope around it. And finally, a peg lipid. The peg lipid there traditionally is for a stealth coating to allow systemic uh, delivery and distribution. Uh, here, we need a big because we have downstream uh, purification systems that really needed a peg to allow for the particle to be produced. Typically, in our first iterations of the technology, particles were around 140 nanometers. The self-amplifying RNA systems were uh, functionally, if we looked by cryo uh, EM or uh, dynamic light scattering, about 70 nanometers. The quite large structures typically around you know, 10 to 12,000 bases uh, compared to smaller conventional RNAs in the kind of three to 5,000 base range. So we got high encapsulation uh, uh, rates with the technology around you know, 95%. Uh, after 2012, we did publish more data around the LMP process. And here we're just depicting from a publication in 2015 showing a tea mixer on a, a syringe pump uh, system that we were able to manufacture the LMPs with the self amplifying RNA, uh, lipids in ethanol, RNA in a low pH buffer. That means when the lipid interacts with it, it's at a pH where the ionizable lipid is protonated and you get a charge-charge interaction. You then dilute the system, equilibrate, and at 33% ethanol, the particles anneal and self-assemble. And then as you dilute them further, uh, you uh, bring the P pH up to 7.4, the particles become neutral. You then process them through uh, tangential flow filtration to remove the ethanol, concentrate the particles, and put them in a physiological buffer that you can then administer uh, for preclinical and clinical settings, sterile filtration, and then you have your product. On all of this, we could build on a small scale, uh, even tangential flow filtration in you know, 2012, there were systems available from Spectrum Labs that you could mimic an industrial process at a few mils. So we were able to mimic a scaled down process for the LMP system, giving us more confidence that it could be scaled. But there was a still, you know, a, a nagging doubt uh, within the pharma teams about how scalable this was. There's just a graveyard of liposomal scale up problems and issues over the last 30 years in the industry. A pivotal moment for the entire mRNA field came in 2012 when DARPA started to fund us. Uh, at Novartis, we see, received a contract for $14 million to uh, fund the development of our self amplifying or replicating RNA vaccine platform, but others were funded such as uh, Sanofi in collaboration with CureVac and even Moderna in its early iterations as a startup received significant funding from DARPA. Uh, they funded hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into the field and really enabled the mRNA uh, vaccine uh, initiatives that we uh, see today being utilized for COVID. In March 2013, there was an opportunity for the Novartis vaccine team to show the utility of their mRNA vaccine platform for pandemic response. In China, three people had died from a novel H7N9 bird flu. 
the CDC had isolated uh, the virus from these people and they published online the sequence of the virus. We were lucky enough to be collaborating with Craig Venter's team at Synthetic Genomics in San Diego. They went ahead from that sequence online, synthesized the gene. That gene was then shipped to us at Novartis in Cambridge and Boston. We then uh, put it into our plasmid vector, went ahead and made uh, RNA. By day eight, from the sequence going online in China, we were able to you know, have full length RNA with the H7 cloned in. Down the bottom here in the Agora's gel, you can see the, the vector running around you know, 10 KB. And then we expressed it in cells. And you can see here on the Western blot, uh, the H7 lighting up. We were lucky enough to have a, an antibody that recognized the H7 from uh, an H7N3 uh, flu virus, and it did cross react. So functional expression of the H7. By day 13, uh, we had lined up some mice, got IACUC approval. We vaccinated the mice uh, uh, twice with a two week interval, and we went ahead and measured functional antibody responses. What we're measuring here is hemagglutinin inhibition titers. This is quite an old assay. You take red blood cells and you look at the ability of uh, antibodies in the serum to inhibit uh, viral binding and nucleation and precipitation of those red blood cells. And uh, a functional titer of 40 is considered protective in, in this model. So we primed uh, the mice either with uh, naked H7 at one microgram, LMP formulated H7. We had no uh, uh, viral uh, system, no vaccine available at the time. So we went with a negative control uh, and H1 uh, hemagglutinin encoded in the, the vector, again encapsulated in, uh, in, in an LMP. By day 35, a few weeks after the boost, you can see uh, functional HI titers well above uh, the coral of protection of 40, and all the mice have seroconverted. Eight, naked H7 not working and the negative control also not working. Interestingly, if we increase the interval between the prime and the boost out to eight weeks, we get much higher levels of uh, hemagglutinin inhibition titers up in the thousands. So this is 2013 and really showing that uh, we were able to rapidly move from a sequence of a virus uh, and generate a, a vaccine with, within days uh, of that sequence becoming available. By 2015, we'd cover a lot of ground with different uh, viral targets, different animal models. This slide just summarizing you know, some of the work that was published in more than 20 publications. And you'll find that list if you're interested uh, in as a backup slide. We had two big collaborations, one with NIAD uh, down in Bethesda, where we explored flu. Those data uh, we did in non-human primates and have not been published to date. And also a collaboration with USAMRID, where we went into uh, their aerosol uh, guinea pig uh, challenge models. Again, uh, unpublished data uh, at this time. So in 2015, the platform transitioned as part of the asset swap from Novartis to GSK. And uh, I left uh, the, the platform and, and moved on uh, to explore other activities in San Diego. Uh, but, you know, GSK continued to work on uh, the, the platform and Recently, uh, they started a clinical trial. They chose not to move forward with the lipid nanoparticle uh, uh, formulation because of reservations around scale up. In parallel, we developed a cationic nano emulsion where we can uh, adsorb the RNA to the surface. We had a scalable process to manufacture that nano uh, emulsion based on our manufacturing process for MF59. Uh, no data available yet for this clinical trial. It'll be interesting uh, to see uh, how well uh, the vaccine performed. That initial trial was uh, in rabies using the glycoprotein G. So what has changed since 2015? Well, quite a lot. And I'm gonna focus on, you know, for the lipid nanoparticle space, 
what's happened here, just depicting the unit operations to manufacture uh, an LMP. You need some kind of mixing technology. I showed you previously that very crude syringe pump tea mixer system that we developed. You then need to dialyze away the ethanol concentrate and put it in a physiological buffer, sterile filtration. These two units are pretty well known in the field. A lot of activity has happened around mixing and significant progress has been made. And certainly, you know, with the commercialization of the Pfizer and Moderna, uh, vaccines, LMPs have been shown uh, to be scalable. And luckily for us in the field, GMP production units are now available from multiple vendors and you can buy them and, and put them in a clean room in a CDMO and begin manufacture of lipid nanoparticles. One of those systems is from NAWA. This is an HPLC company based in uh, Germany and they, they were utilized by Pfizer to scale up their uh, LMP formulation process for the COVID vaccine. Here they're using a jet uh, uh, impinger system uh, and, and a series of HPLC systems pumping in parallel, and that was successfully implemented. Uh, Precision Nan Systems is another company. They focus on a microfluidic system. Many people use their Ignite system to do all of the preclinical work. They now offer a GMP system with a microfluidics uh, chip that works at high scale and high flow rates and can reproduce the formulations produced at the bench top for the preclinical uh, uh, systems. And that system is available, you know, as a unit you can buy and, and put into a, a clean room and control uh, the process for manufacture of LPs. This means that, you know, that the LMP formulation process is, is very much de-risk for new biotechs coming into the field. I now work at Replicate Biosciences. Uh, we uh, announced our Series A funding from uh, Apple Tree Partners uh, earlier in the year. Here's the team. We bring you know, great depth of self-replicating mRNA vaccine development along with manufacturing, delivery, and, and antigen design. We focus our efforts on all four pillars, protein insert, including being able to express multiple genes off the same vector. We focus on self-replicating systems. We're developing second generation proprietary vectors that work better than the existing state of the art alpha virus uh, V vectors that people are currently using. We have a deep understanding about delivery and uh, how to optimize that. And we know a lot of, about manufacturing and scale up these self-amplifying systems are very different, much larger, have a different stability profile to conventional vectors, and tweaks and improvements in the manufacturing process need to be implemented to be successful. But we're building all four pillars together simultaneously to make uh, uh, progress to moving forward. We believe that the current mRNA technologies are, are limited by low levels and short durations of protein expression. We think that we can drive protein expression up uh, and the duration of the expression using these novel uh, proprietary self-replicating vectors that we're developing. With that, I'm gonna say thank you. Hopefully, you know, I'll have the opportunity to present the work that we're doing uh, with at Replica in the future, uh, but I'll be happy to take questions uh, in the question and answer session that will follow uh, shortly. Thank you.
Now let's move on to our next presenter, Dr. Kia Raksrantham, who is a professor of medicine at Chula Lungkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand, and the scientific chair of the Chula Vaccine Research Center. Professor Kiat is an accomplished physician scientist with more than 300 peer-reviewed papers covering the areas of HIV, immunology, allergies, and vaccine. And today, Professor Kiat is gonna tell us about his work on the development of novel vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 and bringing the vaccine into the Thai clinics. Kiat, we look forward to your presentation. What I'm going to present to you today is the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine uh, development at our Chula Vaccine Research Center in Thailand. Uh, the name of the vaccine is Chula COP-19. I think all of you have been aware that vaccine inequity uh, remain a challenge in terms of rolling out a vaccination globally. This is the, the most updated uh, uh, data from the Bloomberg vaccine vaccination tracker. So the, the approximately uh, more than 7.3 billion uh, doses has been uh, vaccinated globally. And uh, with the average of 30 to 40 million doses uh, delivered per day. But what I like to highlight uh, in some area, particularly in, in African continents and some of the uh, Pacific regions and also uh, some of the, Eastern, uh, the, the uh, Western uh, Asia uh, region. And you can see that the, this region, some of the city or the countries have been vaccinated at least for one dose less than 5% some of them less than 30%, whereas uh, other developed, more developed countries uh, in green, in, in dark green, has been vaccinated more than 60% or, or more than 80%. So it's, it's the issue of no one safe, if not everyone safe, uh, from the uh, WHO statement, is, I think is very clear, because this will create an opportunity of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus to mutate and, and develop uh, different valence, uh, uh, for, for example, like Delta valence that has been uh, outbreaks uh, globally recently. At our center, a vaccine, uh, Chula Vaccine Research Center at the Faculty of Medicine, Chula Longkorn University, uh, we, in the past decade, we have been working on other technology platform. Uh, it's a subunit protein, a DNA and viral life particle for other uh, uh, diseases. And when the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic has been outbreak globally, so we switch uh, our focus in collaboration with uh, Professor Du Weissman from U, U of Pennsylvania uh, to uh, mainly focus on Jula cop 19 vaccine. Uh, the question is that, uh, would, would that be too late for Thailand to still developing our own vaccine? Uh, we, uh, our team, including our government, believe that it's, it's not the case because we have been learning a lesson that if we, for any pandemic uh, in, the, in the last decade and the next future pandemics to come, if we have to rely on purchasing only we have to wait up to a year to get access to vaccine uh, for most of our population and particularly for the low middle income country. So to complete uh, our value chain of, of capacity building from development, testing, uh, legislation and manufacturing and commercialization is very critical uh, for a low middle income country like Thailand. Um, by the time we started our programs uh, back in the Feb February last year, uh, we don't know yet whether mRNA vaccine will work, but in a number of preclinical and early vac uh, uh, vaccine trial from other uh, diseases in the past uh, few years have shown that this is a promising technology. 
basically, instead of we making the whole virus uh, and make it inactivated or using viral vector or manufacturing the vaccine as a protein plus adjuvant. So the technology approach is to synthesize uh, a message, uh, messenger RNA and encapsulated with lipid nanoparticle. And this we allow uh, uh, to deliver mRNA vaccine uh, uh, immunogen into the ribosome and uh, guide the cell to produce specific protein, in this case, a spike protein. Um, and uh, in the since uh, last, uh, the end of last year, at least two mRNA vaccine has been proven that efficacious, a very high efficacy up to 95%, in this case, it's Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, and had been uh, authorized for emergency use in the developed country in mainly, and, 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 and few middle-income country. And right now, at least like Pfizer also has been uh, fully approved for general use. So that's a good news for us. Now, what the difference between our immunogen design and uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. This is a review article from uh, Professor Drew Weisman and his team uh, this month, actually. And you can see that the similarity or the, the, the same approach, is this is a nucleoside modified uh, mRNA. There, there are uh, two different. The first difference is both uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna uh, this have designed by having a uh, dipolene mutation to get a perfusion spike, transmembrane perfusion spike. In contrast, we are using a white height transmembrane spike. So this is not uh, uh, mutated uh, by dipolene. We call the non-dipolene, non-perfusion spike uh, immunogen. And the lipid uh, uh, encapsulation also from different uh, uh, sources. Our uh, the, the data I'm going to present again, it is very prelim preliminary, haven't been published yet, uh, about to be uh, uh, submit. Um, the, the, for the uh, preclinical development and uh, uh, clinical testing, phase one and two, uh, mainly funded uh, two thirds by the government. So this is the funding agency of the government and the one third form uh, the uh, public donation to the uh, High Red Cross uh, Society and for to, to our medical school. This is the uh, overall uh, milestone that uh, our July COP-19 mRNA vaccine development has been rich and, and planned it. Um, so in the Q2 last year, so we have been shown that this uh, immunogen can induce a very high neutralizing antibody titer. This is a live virus neutralization test with a median of uh, more than 40,000 uh, GMT, uh, a median titer. And in macaque, uh, we also have shown that it's a, a high induction antibody level uh, of 5,000. This is with uh, 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 50 microgram in, in, in macaque. And this is with uh, uh, 10 micrograms in, in mice. And uh, because at that time, we don't have this uh, manufacturing capacity in Thailand yet, uh, why we are waiting for technology transfer. So we have to uh, identify CDMO partner. So uh, uh, it take time to, to identify partner and uh, to get a final slot for manufacturing and some technology need to be licensing, licensed. So um, at the end, uh, we got uh, uh, have a CDMO uh, partner with trialing to make the GMP lot for clinical uh, phase one uh, 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 mRNA from trialing and, uh, and then encapsulated by uh, IBI, integrity bio with the technology transfer 
and uh, supervised by a genuine in terms of lipid nanoparticle encapsulation. And by the time, so we it, it has been taking longer than we expected because again, because we don't have the, the full capacity to manufacturing our own uh, GMP lot. And so it's almost uh, 11 months that uh, we be able to start phase one uh, in mid of June and then and then later on few few months later to start phase two. Um, in the meantime that we preparing clinical development and also working on the CDMO production in the US. Uh, the Thai French company uh, named uh, Bionet Asia also were working in parallel with us, uh, taking getting the technology transfer for the production. In the in the meantime, as well, we also prepared the second generation uh, vaccine in case the first generation cannot cross neutralize uh, uh, well enough for against a uh, new valence. So we also making valence or second generation immunogen vaccine. Now um, I like to to share with you, I mean, we have a quite a number of uh, preclinical data, but within, in terms of time limited. Uh, so we're going to share with you some of the interlim analysis of phase one in, in young adult and preliminary analysis and, and, and a result of uh, elderly uh, phase one and, and also phase two in, in young adult. So we, uh, we have to, you know, uh, thanks our our volunteer that although they have a number of uh, options uh, provided free from the government, they also uh, committed to uh, participate in the in our trial. So thank to all the volunteer. And uh, this is our clinical trial team. So we have uh, three, uh, four clinical trial uh, a unit. Uh, uh, that can help us to do a, a well quick clinical trial uh, in our uh, in our medical school and, and hospital, and also with our partner. And uh, beside have uh, only a convalescent SILA cohort to do a comparative study, there's an opportunity because uh, at this timeline, we you know in the past. Uh, uh, few months, uh, our neighborhood country like Malaysia also get access to Pfizer and in Thailand, we get access to AstraZeneca and Sinovac and recently Pfizer. So we have a prospective with ethic uh, committee approval uh, cohort uh, to have a Pfizer uh, vaccinated cohort, AstraZeneca and Sinovac cohort, including a uh, convalescent cohort to do a comparative study. So the phase one trial uh, started uh, mid of June. And this is summary of the three uh, uh, phase trials. So, so is, uh, we have two phase one. Um, this is the first phase one, it's uh, age 18 to 55. And the second phase one is uh, older. So it's 56 to 75. Um, and also then after the, we look at the data and the DSMB recommend to select, select a dose to go further for phase two uh, for another 150 volunteer. Uh, the age is 18 to 59. Again, we have to thank all the participants and the future participants going to join our phase three in the very near future. So this is uh, the data of the live virus neutralizing and session again, white high data. So in in blue and light blue is the July COP19. Uh, this is uh, the data we look at the uh, the endpoint of one week after the second dose. Uh, so day 29, you can see that it's a dose dependent response. Uh, this is the GMT uh, uh, micro-neutralization uh, 50 titer and compare with the convalescent serum, the pool serum combining uh, my and and, mod, uh, and severe uh, COVID-19 cases, 
the GMT is about 700. And the CV case is uh, uh, 20, uh, 2100. And uh, the my case is less than 300. And you can see that uh, this is a Pfizer uh, 1700. Uh, Sinovac is uh, 150 and AstraZeneca. So it's, uh, this finding is similar to uh, most of the um, clinical trial from that particular or specific vaccine trial has been reported. And uh, the other question that we like to ask is whether this uh, Jula COP-19 capable to uh, with that high magnitude that immerse on can cross neutralize uh, or wireless valence. Uh, this is the test by pseudo virus neutralization test. Um, and this is again white high, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Uh, it's like many other uh, previous report of any vaccine, including Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccine. They, they uh, always have a significant drop. Uh, again, valence with the first generation vaccine, but you can see that always drop, but it's still in the level that uh, uh, high enough to uh, cross neutralize uh, these four valence in, in vitro. Uh, this the bar, though is not a consensus correct of protection level, but this is based on a published paper um, from the Oxford vaccine group. Um, showing that the pseudo virus neutralization test at this uh, cutoff of 150, 185 may equivalent to 80% efficacy in the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine uh, study. What about the T cell responses? Um, so we have, uh, this is the um, a comparison between the first phase one in younger adult and the second uh, and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and the second phase one um, elder uh, participant. And you can see that in green, different doses, 10, 25, 50 micrograms in green uh, is the uh, young adult. And in purple is the in elderly. Uh, so if you look at uh, at the dose, uh, the same dose comparison. So it's about 10 microgram and 10 microgram. It's a half drop, so two four drop when uh, in the older uh, participant. So uh, up, up to 1400 down to 600. And the 25 microgram is 2500 down to uh, 1300. Interestingly, in the 50 microgram, there's no uh, uh, any different dog of uh, Eli spot gamma antifilon production per million cells. So it's about 2000, uh, both uh, group. So uh, for our uh, internal analysis for the, the, the uh, phase one young adult, so the manuscript in, in preparation. Uh, so, as, so in terms of safety, tolerability is well tolerated and there, there was no uh, see that as well as it went. Uh, the vaccine be able to induce high neutralizing antibody, again, white high virus. And the titer is high enough, although it's a, a, a drop, again, all other four valence, but it's still be able to cross neutralize again all tested uh, valence alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and can induce high level of SARS-CoV-2 specific T cell responses. Now this is the uh, phase two. Uh, again, this is very pre preliminary, preliminary data. Um, so this is it uh, four to one. Uh, Jula COP 19, 50 microgram had been selected and recommended by our DSMB and our research team to go further uh, and four in four to one ratio to compare with uh, placebo. Uh, the age group is 18 to 59. And, uh, and after 29th day of the placebo arm, we will then uh, receive, this will be unblinded and receive uh, Pfizer-BioNTech for two doses. 
and this is uh, also uh, three weeks uh, apart. Here is the the AE profile, perceptive profile. There's the, there's no uh, ciliate aspect event um, for the the first dose. There's no fever at all. Both arm the placebo and the Jula cup nineteen uh, arm. A uh, local pain is more significant. It's uh, very significant, like uh, other mRNA vaccine compared to placebo. Uh, interestingly, for the first dose, the placebo has uh, participant has report more headache, uh, almost twice uh, higher than the active vaccine Jula cup nineteen group. Uh, the fatigue are uh, very uh, similar, forty percent from Jula cup nineteen group versus 30%. Uh, when the second dose, the fever um, is zero in the placebo arm and 24% in uh, the Jula COP-19 arm. Uh, chew is about one third. Headache uh, is higher in the vaccine arm versus the placebo and fatigue, uh, similar finding. All uh, AE, uh, mainly are mild. Um, a few uh, moderate and very rare as uh, as as a great tree, and uh, these these uh, are transients, so generally uh, resolves uh, within the average of less than two and a half days. Here is the uh, preliminary result of antibody binding, and, and you can see that uh, this is the baseline in. In orange, it's a placebo arm. Um, light blue is a Jula COP-19 arm baseline. And three weeks after, this is three weeks after the first dose, we start seeing a binding in the body with the uh, AU per mil uh, of GMT about 800. And then um, rising up to 9,000 at one week after the second dose and, and uh, 16,000 uh, four weeks after the second dose on day 50. Um, and this is the uh, RBDSE2 binding inhibition or uh, also known as a surrogate virus neutralization test. Um, Again, the baseline is uh, below detection level of both arm. Uh, this is one week after uh, the first dose and three weeks after the first dose, we start to see uh, almost half of, of a participant in the active arm as more than the cutoff of this assay is a 68% that related to efficacy. And uh, by one week after the um, uh, the uh, second dose, we have seen the GMT up to 95 or 96%. In terms of T cell study, this is the ELI spot. So T cell is the subgroup study, uh, two to one. So we have uh, up to 60 volunteer from Jula Corp and about uh, up to 30 uh, from Pfizer group that uh, has been uh, switched from after and blinded of placebo arm and all we will receive Pfizer. And uh, look at day 29. So it's mean one week after the second dose compared to one week after the second dose of Pfizer. In green is a Jula COP-19 and, uh, and the uh, orange or, or pink is a, is a Pfizer. Uh, the average median, the, the median of uh, gamma antifalon spot performing cell per million cells of uh, PBMC is 2,000 in Jula COP-19 versus about up to 1,000 by Pfizer. So it's, the p-value is below uh, 0.1. And with uh, all those uh, very promising data, uh, recently, just a week, a week ago, the government agreed to fund uh, a larger uh, funding for us to pursue a uh, late fit uh, development and also prepare some of the larger scale production 
for the uh, post EUA approval. So this is a 2.3 billion Thai baht. That's the good news for us. And um, the partner that uh, we, uh, as our strategic partner uh, uh, to produce, uh, to manufacture uh, our uh, Chula COP19 vaccine is BioNet Asia. So it's well, one of the five Asian uh, biotech uh, vaccine company that has been listed recently that uh, have capability after tech transferring to produce mRNA vaccine among 10 other uh, besides Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. So here the overall um, clinical development plan. So we are in the this step of preparing immunobleaching phase three study and safety. And then uh, after, so this is waiting for the final uh, protocol approval by the by the Thai FDA. Uh, the concept has been uh, agreed upon after the consultation. And after uh, the EUA, we have to do a phase four safety effectiveness study to prospectively follow up at least 30,000 uh, participants to ensure safety and effectiveness uh, at least six to 12 months uh, for uh, the next step full approval. In the meantime, because by the time we got approval meet up next year, uh, as earlier, um, at earliest, that means we have to also prepare to do uh, a booster study and uh, adolescent study as well. So I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Kia, wonderful presentation. Thanks for sharing your experiences and data with all of us. It's really great stuff. Uh, a quick reminder to the audience, if you have a question for Kia, just go ahead and type it into the Q&A area of the stage tab on the right-hand side of your screen. We're gonna try to get to as many of your questions as possible in our Q&A section coming up right after the next presenter. Being a former malaria researcher myself for many years, I'm very much looking forward to the next presenter and her work. Dr. Evelina Angoff is the Chief of Laboratory of Molecular Parasitology and Biologics Research and Development at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, where she has been doing research into malaria for over 25 years, much of that time spent on vaccine development. Evelina has received numerous awards for her research and is a holder of numerous patents, and in June of this year was the senior author on some groundbreaking work published in MPJ vaccines using mRNA to provide a protective response against malaria and a mouse model of the disease. Evelina is going to tell us more about the data and the work that went into the recent paper. Evelina, the audience is yours. 
Hello, I'd like to first thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our work at this year's mRNA Day event. I am required to present this disclaimer that the assertions made here are mine and not those of the US Army or the US Department of Defense. Malaria continues to be the most important tropical disease affecting humans. It is a life-threatening disease caused by parasites transmitted through the bite of infected female Anopheles mosquitoes. Five parasite species cause malaria in humans, and two of these species, Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax, pose the greatest health threat. In 2019, there were an estimated 229 million cases of malaria worldwide and 409,000 deaths, mostly of vulnerable children under the age of five. As the global map shows, the African region carries a disproportionately high burden of malaria, with 94% of all malaria cases and deaths occurring in this region. Currently, effective management of malaria is based on chemoprophylaxis and vector control tools such as impregnated bed nets and insecticide repellents. Briefly, the malaria parasite develops both in humans and in female Anopheles mosquitoes. The size and genetic complexity of the parasite means that each infection presents thousands of antigens to the human immune system. Malaria infection begins when an infected female Anopheles mosquito bites a person, injecting plasmodium parasites in the form of sporozoites into the bloodstream. The sporozoites travel quickly to the human liver where they invade hepatocytes. These sporozoites multiply asexually over the next seven to 10, next, uh, seven to 10 days, causing no symptoms at this stage of the infection. When the liver cells rupture, the merozoites are released into the bloodstream where they rapidly invade the red blood cells. These blood stage parasites also replicate asexually, rapidly reaching a high parasite burden and destroying each red blood cell that they infect. This leads to the clinical symptoms of malaria. A small percentage of merozoites do differentiate into male and female gametocytes, which are taken up by the mosquito in her next blood meal. It is these gametocytes that then cause the cycle of transmission to continue back into the mosquito host. The target of this presentation is the plasmodium falciparum CSP or circumsporozoic protein. This is the major surface coat antigen of plasmodium falciparum malaria sporozoites and a prime preerythrocytic vaccine target. Antibodies targeting the plasmodium falciparum sporozoites play a key and central role in developing immunity to malaria. While malaria vaccines have been in development now for more than 30 years, this past October 2021, the RTSS AS01, a malaria subunit vaccine based on plasmodium falciparum CSP fusion with hepatitis B surface antigen developed by GlaxoSmithKline was recommended by the WHO for use and prevention of P. falciparum malaria in children living in regions with moderate to high transmission. While this was a milestone achievement for malaria. This vaccine particularly um, confers partial efficacy against malaria infection. RTSS AS01 does induce antibodies and CD4 T cell responses. High titer of antibodies are to the central repeat region and the avidity of antibodies to the C terminus are partially associated with this vaccine's efficacy. A second CSB hepatitis B surface antigen um, candidate developed by Oxford University and is currently undergoing phase three trial is called R21 matrix M and is similar to RTSS with hepatitis B surface antigen fused to the same portions of the C term and central repeats as are included in R RTSS. Because the R21 lacks the excess hepatitis B surface antigen found in RTSS, it provides a higher density of CSP epitopes displayed on the virus-like particle surface. This would, lead in, this would lead to enhanced B cell activation and potentially stronger CSP-specific antibodies. Sterile protection has been observed for this vaccine in adults in a controlled human malaria infection study, as well as significant reduction in time to clinical disease in children in a phase 2B trial performed in Africa. Monoclonal antibodies to CS have been proposed as a strategy for short-term infection blocking interventions. This could be used as a conjugate to other short-term interventions, such as the anti-malarial drugs. This would be particularly useful for travelers, tourists, deploying military and public health personnel. 
In a recently published study performed at the NIH's VRC, nine participants received the CSP long-acting monoclonal antibody targeting this unique region on PFCSP, the junctional region, which occurs between the N-terminal subunit and the NANP repeat. These um, subjects underwent controlled human malaria infection, and none had any detectable parasitemia through study day 21. These findings pro provide broad implications in the, not only the design of CSP second generation vaccines, but also for the application of anti-malarial antibodies targeting this epitope for limited seasonal control campaigns. These findings all highlight the potential role of antibodies to CSP in protection uh, against infection. In the absence of immune correlates of protection, animal models of infection and use of surrogates surrogate in vitro functional assays can facilitate the down selection of vaccine candidates. In the malaria field, we're fortunate to have well-established human and murine models of malaria infection. Since 1985, rare investigators have used controlled human malaria infection for malaria vaccine and drug development to evaluate products in well-controlled early phase proof of concept clinical trials. This would facilitate the progression of only the most promising candidates for further evaluation in malaria endemic areas. RARE has performed over 100 controlled human malaria infection studies in over 2,200 subjects over the last 30 years. Since human malaria parasites are non-infectious in mice, transgenic rodent parasites expressing the human malaria antigen of interest or humanized mice are required to assess protective responses. We have two parasite transgenic lines, the rodent parasite P. burgii anca, expressing either the P. falciparum NF54 3D7 allele of CSP at the P. burgii CSP locus and under the P. burgii CSP promoter control and the P. burgii PF CSP welcome strain, which is heterologous to the CSP immunogen strain used in these studies um, that we'll report on today. In vitro functional assays may also serve as surrogates to in vivo effector mechanisms. The inhibition of liver stage development assay, the ILSDA, tests antibodies for the ability to block sporozoite development in hepatocytes. Using an in vitro plasmodium falciparum liver stage um, culture system in cryopreserved primary human hepatocytes with real time PCR measurements of 18S ribosomal RNAs from P. falciparum, a more quantitative assessment of liver stage development and parasite burden can be achieved. As we are all aware, the benefits of mRNA LMPs as a vaccination platform are evident from the compelling efficacy results of the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Both vaccines demonstrated good safety profiles, induction of potent and durable immunity, scalable manufacturing processes, and, a, and an ease of sequence ad adaptation not seen previously for any other vaccine platform. With regards to storage and cold chain issues, better understanding of the causes and mechanisms of the instability of mRNA and mRNA formulations is still needed. Selection of appropriate stabilization technologies will lead to improvements in mRNA vaccines. This would enable shipping and storaging at refrigerated or ambient temperatures across the entire vaccine supply chain. We, we will report on the application of mRNA LNP technology targeting preerythrocytic malaria, focusing on the induction of responses to the vaccine target PFCSP. We developed two mRNA transcripts. One was produced by Trilink and one from collaboration with Dr. Drew Weissman at the University of Pennsylvania. Highlighted in red are the qualitative differences between the two mRNAs. This includes codon content, either codon harmonized or optimized. Uh, nucleoside modifications with one of the mRNAs not being nucleoside modified and the other being modified. And signal sequence with one being wild type falciparum se signal sequence and the other having an optimized uh, mammalian signal sequence and the method of mRNA purification being either silica membrane versus a cellulose purification process. For this study, that both mRNAs were encapsulated using LMPs provided by Acutis Therapeutics for their uh, efficient delivery and uptake into cells. To verify that the mRNA transcripts translated to the desired proteins, we performed in vitro transfection experiments in CHO cells. 
On the left panels, translated PFCSP protein was successfully detected by fluorescence microscopy. Fluorescent images either show the nuclear staining or the CSP staining alone or the overlays and the negative controls on the lower panels. To verify cellular translocation, we use Western blotting techniques. The detected translated protein solely was found in, in cells or the cell pellet. There was no evidence of secretion to the uh, supernatants in, in these, uh, for both of these mRNAs. Samples were harvested at either 8, 24, or 48 hours following transfection. And you can see where the arrow points to the main band uh, where the main full-length CSP protein migration occurs. We evaluated the two PFCSP encoding mRNA LNPs in two mouse strains, either BALPSIs or C57 blacks, as well as um, with two versus three dose regimens, three versus six week intervals, and 10 versus one microgram doses in BALPC. We explored antibody specificities against various protein and peptide targets in ELISA's and assessed the quality of antibodies either for their avidity or their isotype subclass and functional activities using the ILSDA assay and for protection against transgenic parasite challenges. In C57 black mice, we observed sterile protection with both the UPEN mRNA and the TriLink mRNAs. While there was a trend for the UPEN mRNA having superior protective responses, differences did not achieve statistical significance. Antibodies to CS for the three doses were superior to the groups receiving only the two doses. And there was no significant difference in parasite inhibition in the ILSDA between either of the three dose groups. Um, however, the two dose group using TriLink mRNA did fail to induce significant inhibition in the ILSDA assay. A multivariate analysis of the sum of the data revealed that protection induced by the UPEN mRNA was positively associated with antibodies to the C-terminus of CSP and the isotype um, specificity, while the trilink mRNA responses were weakly associated with antibodies to the N-terminal junctional region. In BALBS, when we used three doses at three week intervals, we observed no difference in protection against transgenic um, parasite challenge. However, these antibodies were parallel those that were observed in the C57 blacks. A multivariate analysis revealed that unlike the C57 blacks in the valves, the protection was significantly associated with the N-terminal junctional and NAMP repeat regions for the UPEN mRNA while for the trilink mRNA, there was a weaker association to the full length CSP and the junctional region. In BALBS, when we increased the interval to six weeks, we overall observed a higher protective efficacy against infection. Um, these antibodies were in, inhibiting, in, these antibodies inhibited the parasite development in the ILS, the assay. However, there was no difference between the three versus two doses, as was observed in the C57 blacks. Protection was either weakly associated or strongly associated with the NAMP repeats for the UPEN and the trilink mRNAs, respectively. We next evaluated a lower dose of mRNAs in valve Cs to assess for dose sparing capabilities and for the potential to reduce any reactogenicity of higher doses of mRNA LNPs. MRNAs were administered three times at three week intervals at uh, using one microgram each of the MRNAs. Even at the 10 times lower doses, high titers of antibodies were induced that were stable for up to six weeks after the final immunization. The antiparasitic activity of these antibodies were assessed in the ILSDA assay. For the UPEN mRNA, no significant difference in, a, in inhibition was observed between the two weeks post and the six weeks post third immunization when tested at a one to 300 fold dilution. These results were highly correlated with each other as well. The results suggest that at a lower dose of mRNA, it is sufficient to induce functional inhibitory antibodies. 
we were not able to complete the analysis of all the samples prior to this meeting. And we are currently testing the trialing samples in the ILSDA assay to determine whether the trialing mRNA when administered at a lower dose induce similar inhibition and whether the inhibition is durable as was seen with the UPEN mRNA for up to six weeks. To assess the spectrum of cytokine responses induced by mRNAs, we used a multiplex array platform, the MSD, for identifying and analyzing trends in cytokine profiles from the vaccinated mice splenocytes. No statistical differences were observed in cytokine levels in C57 blacks, with the exception of the IL-4 and IL-5 um, cytokine responses for the UPEN mRNA. While in the BALBs, no significant differences were observed either in cellular cytokines using the six-week interval for the two mRNAs that were administered at three doses. However, there was a significant difference in cytokine levels between the three versus two immunization schedule, suggesting that to induce um, the evidence of a Th1 or Th2 type response, um, evidence of a stronger response um, required a third immunization. And finally, um, our data support the use of P PFCSP mRNAs as protective in the two models um, that we reported on here, two mouse strains against two different transgenic parasites. Nominally, the induced antibodies are stable and functional against the parasites and appear to be associated with protection in mice. Although, uh, depending on whether it's the C57 blacks or the valves or two versus uh, three immunizations, um, different specificities were revealed. Our findings suggest that the UPEN mRNA LNP may induce a more potent, balanced Th1 type response, Th1, Th2 response, while the trialing mRNA was biased more toward a Th1 type response. These differences may be attributed to the differences in the qualitative characteristics of the two different mRNAs, which, as I mentioned earlier, included codon content, nucleoside modifications, potentially UTRs, and, and the methods of purification. Additional work is needed to fully reveal the role of CSP antibodies in the murine protection models, and we plan to evaluate the contribution of T cells in the protective responses. And finally, I'd like to uh, acknowledge um, the members of the laboratory and the team at RARE, including our entomology branch, branch for support in challenge studies, as well as our colleagues at the NMRC malaria group for the ILSDA assay, which they have established in their laboratory. I'd like to acknowledge our collaborators at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Drew Weissman and Dr. Norbe Norbert Party, as well as our collaborators at Acutus and LUMC Leiden for um, providing us with the transgenic PFCSP NF54 transgenic parasite strain. Our funders at USAID and the US Military Infectious Disease Research Program. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Truly exciting stuff, Evelina. I really look forward to the next steps in your research. I think it's going to have a really huge impact on a lot of people's lives. So thanks again for sharing all that with us. If you have any questions for Evelina or any of the other presenters, just use the Q&A section on the stage tab to the right of your screen. Now, thanks again so much for everyone for joining us in this track, and we hope you enjoyed the presentations today. But don't forget, if you missed track two or haven't seen any of those presentations, don't forget to come back when the on-demand version of the event is ready. Now, let's get the Q&A session started so that we can try and get through all of these really great questions that have been pouring in. Bear with us for just a few moments as we transition into our Q&A panel discussion session. So the first question I had, I wanted to open it up to the panel uh, for discussion. Um, you know, and this may not be something you all know, but something we can all just kind of uh, talk about. In your sort of dealings with mRNA, uh, you know, vaccines and, and the work that you all do, have you ever noticed anything or has anyone ever published materials on um, the theoretical limit of what could be the largest either piece of, of mRNA that you could use in a vaccine or, you know, have people done multiple pieces of mRNA to multiple antigens for um, organisms? Is that something that's been done or ongoing? So, 
So I, I would first um, thank you for the question, but I would um, ask Andrew to to answer first because he's more accustomed with using these very large uh, self-replicating mRNA, and then I can comment if you want on using multiple RNA uh, at the same time during encapsulation. Great. Hey. So on the self-amplifying RNA side, I've seen constructs as large as uh, 16,000 uh, bases being used uh, and seen several you know, antigens encoded in them. Uh, the longer the RNA gets, the harder they are to make, uh, but it, it's definitely uh, doable. The longer RNAs, though, are, you know, have a, a different stability profile. Uh, you know, so anyone who's venturing into that space, you know, you're going to have to, you know, look at stability of the longer RNAs. Uh, and But certainly you can put several uh, uh, antigens or proteins into one cassette and, and get functional uh, expression. Yeah, I, I would also add to that, and I completely agree. Um, the the longer it's the harder to produce. They are less stable normally. But you can also use another strategy where you can co-encapsulate actually different mRNA that are shorter. Let's say uh, between two thousand to five thousand uh, nu uh, nucle nucleotides, and we've we've tried, and I personally tried to to mix. Um, I mean, co-mix. And, and co-formulate at the same time uh, up to 10 and they were all uh, expressed uh, and they, they had uh, good expression levels, all of them. All of them. Uh, I, I know that other collaborators um, in the group uh, working with Drew and I, they, they even tested more, but also they uh, formulated individually and co-mix the particles and then deliver them. Uh, and that also worked. So there was no competition in the in the translational machinery, at least uh, from an immunogenicity standpoint. They, they, there was a good immune response to all these antigens. All right, great. Well, thanks for that, um, Evelyn. I have a question specific for you uh, from a malaria perspective. I know that CSP has been sort of the dominant molecule, uh, you know, from a vaccine perspective for, for quite a while. Um, but in this case, with the work that you're doing, and maybe other people that are doing for, you know, the mRNA vaccines, has there been any, any talk about using, um, you know, an antigen that's different than CSP, any of the other antigens historically that have been looked at or anything new? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, our our focus has been on pre-erythrocytic, partly because of our target population that we're working on vaccine candidates for. Um, however, um, through the literature and through our, we have a consortium, sort of an informal consortium through our funder, there are multiple groups working on blood stage antigens. I can name a couple. Oxford is working on RH5. Our colleagues in our NMRC malaria group, which is here, we're co located here, co-located here right on our site, are working on a novel antigen called E140. And then, of course, um, there was a published paper on a uh, MIF protein and a, I think a GARP protein earlier in the year. Uh, nominally, we hear word that there are multiple targets. We're, of course, interested in pre-erythrocytic mainly. And we really do believe that CSP is going to be sort of a cornerstone antigen for any malaria vaccine candidates, whether it's a you know, down the road, bloodstream, uh, blood stage vaccine candidate, uh, CSP antigen is likely to be part of a combination. Great. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense given some of the profiles you see in infected individuals out in the field, but just wasn't sure if there was other uh, antigens as well. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, again, to the whole panel, there's an interesting question that comes in from uh, Fabrice who asks, um, he says that uh, anti-COVID-19 mRNA vaccines are modified in a particular way with N1 methyl pseudouridine at much higher levels than that are usually found in native human mRNAs. Um, has anyone measured the effects of such a modification? Um, you know, has that been evaluated and what's the impact on cellular processing, say RNA or protein mediated? I don't know if you guys had any insights into that one. So Andrew, do you want to start? I, I, I don't yeah, think this, I have any. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, most of my research has been on wild type, uh, you know, mRNA-based systems. I think you know, UPenn has specialized in in you know 
base modifications. Okay. I'm probably, okay. you know, refer to you as the experts here. So, so uh, basically, these yes, uh, the, the the person what, who has all I, what I can add and contribute is is that the two mRNAs that we evaluated study were one was nucleoside modified and one was not, and one was by the one methyl pseudouridine method, which is from uh, derived from the UPenn sort of concept. And we were particularly surprised when we um, did this head-to-head -head analysis that there wasn't really like great differences between the two mRNAs. Um, having said that, we have not looked at real fine details in terms of cellular processing um, effects at that level. I mean, from a global perspective, we don't see big differences actually, which was a little bit surprising. Um, we had expected that mRNA would be much more focused out on a, inducing a Th1 type response, and then the UPenn mRNA sort of gave us a balanced response, which is what I think others have also reported uh, from COVID vaccines as well. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you were saying. Yeah, I, I, just to answer, so we know that the nucleoside modification, including one metal pseudouridine, does actually change um, the the structures a bit of the mRNA and their interaction with with the ribosomes. So there's there's a couple of papers that have been published, not from our group but from other people, showing that uh, there is a higher density of of polysomes or ribosomes binding to 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 the uh, RNA, and then even the translational efficiency uh, is kind of slowed down, but gives you more protein over time. So uh, this is one one uh, one thing that has been done from a toxicity perspective. These nucleosides, uh, when they are basically chopped out, um, they, they are reincorporated normally in, into the, the normal pool or the pool of uh, modified. And there is a lot of also enzymes that do. Uh, we call them erasers enzyme that can remove these modifications and then chop them chop them out. So um, uh, an extensive study where they track, for example, a one metal pseudouridine that was incorporated and where where it ends up in the metabolism has not been, or at least uh, to the best of my knowledge, has I've never seen this uh, this type of study. So from the bits and pieces, we understand how how things are working, and I hope that answers the question. Great, thanks guys. Uh, looks like we have time for for one more question here. Um, again, another question for for both of you. This might be a little more geared towards uh, Andy and Mohammed. Um, has the COVID nineteen pandemic, you know, from an mRNA sort of manufacturing perspective, has it brought anything uh, to light that you guys were surprised of in terms of you know gearing up for larger scale that you know is still a bit of a challenge for companies to try to get around, whether that be from the mRNA perspective or the LMP perspective. So uh, I, I would say the bigger ch biggest challenges were were basically the synthesis of the of the ionizable lipids that were deployed now. That that was an issue, and then also the supply of the cap structures um, as well. Uh, that was a an, another issue, and it's you know as a from a cost perspective, it also increases the cost of of modifying it or capping capping the the mRNA. Uh, th these were basically, in my opinion, the, the limitations. And I think uh, before COVID or before these mRNA, we didn't have the infrastructure and nobody expected actually that we, we will have to produce that much. Um, I think in the in the future, uh, things will be better. And then um, I've seen a lot of people and they are reaching out to us and reaching out to, to and even we discussed uh, a lot with Trilink, uh, the fact that, you know, there's a lot of people now building new factories and these capabilities uh, everywhere in the world. And Kiat is one of them, for example. What we're seeing is clinical translation of a novel technology. Uh, we've definitely got at least three modalities. And from a technology perspective, they're different. You've got the unmodified CureVac type approach. You've got the base modified approach we, we saw implemented by BioNTech, Pfizer, and Moderna. Then we've got the self-amplifying systems. They're all different. But the common theme we saw clinically was a dose-dependent adverse event profile increasing. And so there's definitely an upper limit to what we can dose in humans. And it's different for each technology. 
And probably the reason for that is slightly different for each one. Uh, but what I think we're learning is there's a lot we can do in terms of the way we make the RNA, the structure at the five prime end, the structure at the three prime end, the UTRs, and the contaminations that come through from the IVT and don't get purified out. The content of uh, double-stranded RNA may be important. The, the amount of uncapped material uh, may be important. The amount of... Uh, 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 five prime triphosphate on the five prime end may be important. So we're starting to learn what might be the critical quality attributes of the mRNA, particularly when you put it inside an LMP and it traffics into the immune compartment. It's going to be different for each technology, but I think you know we're at the beginning of that clinical learnings, and, and uh, there's a lot more to come. Yeah, and I would add uh, to that on top of that, the the fact that also we're learning a lot on how these ionizable lipids are triggering or potentiating more the immune response and how this uh, this this element uh, is contributing to the mRNA as well uh, in, in inducing a, a potent response. That, that's very important in my opinion. Um, there's also the interaction between the lipids and not all lipids are equivalent and do in in the in the particles they can interact with the mrna and sometimes um, mess up actually the the rna uh, that's also something that uh, now we've learned and a lot of people are addressing that and you know the exciting thing for the emerging kind of next generation through, of technologies through the biotech is we're seeing implementation of manufacturing in the CDMO networks. Everybody's got access to it. Making RNA isn't new. It's quite an old technology. It was developed a long time ago. And so we're seeing a lot of investment in to producing RNA for everybody. And, and that's only going to drive further innovation because you don't have to invent that part. You can have somebody formulate your LMPs. You can have somebody make your mRNA. You can focus on the biology and see if you can translate that through into humans. Yeah, right. I totally agree. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Mohammed, Andy, Evelina. Thank you. Uh, great presentations, all of you today. I really appreciate you guys sharing uh, that information with us. Uh, to the audience members, we want to let you know you can move on over to uh, the main stage again. We're going to move back there and we're going to have our uh, closing presentation. Um, and just to let everyone know if you didn't see any of the polls or if you missed any of the polls, just uh, make sure you refresh your page, check those out, and uh, give them an answer. They're kind of fun and interesting. And we'd love to have all that information. Uh, that you're uh, working on in the mRNA. So again, thanks very much, everybody. And we'll see you all back in the main stage.